When comedy makes you feel like this. Ball! Ball! Give me the ball! I want the ball! And drama can make you feel like this. My father killed himself when I was 16. And how can you make those two emotions work in your edit? Sometimes, though, it's a real hard gear shift. Sam discovers Ola's restaurant has been vandalized and trashed, and we cut to the wall. Shut up and dribble. But now, in the script, the next call is to go to the team passing the water bottle around. Fortunately, I had a little piece of Trent Krim jotting in his notebook, and Trent gives us a real quizzical look. It was the perfect transition I needed to then team passing the water bottle around. It then gave us a new question, helps that transition. That's an interesting way to kind of break it up a little bit. AJ and Melissa are the editors of Ted Lasso. A show that uses comedy and drama to explore and challenge toxic masculinity. Fuck! Don't you forget where you came from! Mental health. And fuck you. Not working on yourself after we lost dad. And growth. Great job! Woo! Hear that? Roy said y'all did a great job! And we had a conversation with these industry experts and how they use editing and storytelling to make the show <laughs> tragically hilarious. <laughs> Okay. We explore how to cut to non-verbal cues to tell a story. How slow a pace can actually make a comedy funnier. How holding on a reaction can make an audience cheer. And how to use camera framing to motivate your cuts. This video podcast was recorded with Riverside. It is the best remote video recording tool for podcasts. You can find out more about them later. I'm actually really excited to talk about a Ted Lasso because I think I had a lot of relatability towards this. I'm based in LA and so there's kind of like a reverse Ted Lasso in some sense where it's like I'm I'm the Brit in America working with American teams. What gets me really really excited though is of course is the editing and like and and the storytelling and how you made sure just that the, the general atmosphere and the feeling and the and the vibe that Ted Lasso has created is something that I think has become really unique. Is there like a scene or a or a sequence that you were like just absolutely get really excited to want to talk about? Well, fellas, we got our work cut out for us in the second half. The locker room, the halftime locker room, where everyone's pulling out the believe signs. Right now, all I want to do is let you gentlemen know what an absolute honor it's been to be your coach. I was like, if there's any time to take your time, it's right now. I'd love to get to know each and every single one of you. You know, you want to give everybody their due. And it's, so it's finding those perfect moments of when things should really land. And sometimes it's, it's a matter of us going, okay, mate, wait one more, one more. One more, let it land here. If y'all play hard, play smart, play together and just, you know. There's power in holding back. So you really want to find that balance. Ted taking in that Jamie's pulling out his book from season one that he gave him, and that's where he's keeping the believe sign. And, you know, I really let that play longer than what somebody might have often just picked up right as the book was closing and putting it away. But I was like, I really want people to see this book. And so we did it from the close of it opening. And yeah, just letting the moments play there and then picking the times to go to Ted when it's hitting him and Roy and Nate in the background there. There were so many moments playing for everybody <laughs> that I was just like, oh my gosh. Yeah, Nate, Nate's experience of what's happening in this locker room and Trent experiencing what's in this locker room. So finding the times to go there. Now that I'm thinking through that scene, I think it is primarily reactions. It's thinking in the small moments of like the sign being rebuilt, the entire story is told through the reactions. Like, well, like even for you, what was the story that you were trying to tell by prioritizing on reactions? I'll just say we track these, these character stories. So when Ted is talking to the team about, you know, that he wants to get, get over negative emotions. A lot of times we end up getting in our own way. Things like anger, fear, and shame. You know, crap like envy or on the word shame, we cut to Colin. Shame. Because he hasn't come out yet to the team and he's still withholding a lot of himself. And so that that look we have on Colin was very powerful. I made sure to keep that in from the beginning. I felt that shame really tied to him and, and Billy, the actor, gave us such a beautiful reaction there. Also in that scene, um, when Ted says, you know, um, whether we hurt someone or uh, have been hurt by someone else, and we cut to Roy. Whether we've been hurt or maybe we've hurt somebody else. 
that was a beautiful reaction that actually we, we, that wasn't a kind of plan. That was something that was discovered in the editing room and we found a piece of, of Brett that really worked there. And, and sometimes we slow reactions down because Jason, you know, looks at editing as rewriting a lot. So he's thinking of things in the edit room that not, might not necessarily have been thought of on the set. So, so he'll have us try things and, you know, by either slow down or reaction, but, but look, our cast is amazing and they give us these reactions and Jason wants it, you know, it's not all about Ted Lasso. He wants it to play on the other characters' faces. So you retime reaction shots. You literally like slow down and time warp them. Sometimes. It is rare. I, I don't want to say we're doing it all the time, but it, sometimes you want to really let something linger. Jason's very specific, so he likes certain like eye movements and things. So you'll want to like stay on a part of it and have the rest of it linger. Yeah, so so we have great tools to slow things and to let it linger a bit longer in, in a certain spot. I love that. That's so creative. That's such a problem solving move you know you're like okay this is like it's perfect we need this moment but like it's not quite working he blinks here or he starts to look away that's a, such a creative thing that i would have never thought of to solve that issue we do that like very rarely like because this cast is so good they usually you have everything but a lot of the times with the later episodes too there was such big stories we were telling that it was hard to probably cover all of that. Jason has a term for that. He calls it movie magic. It's he's, it's something he thought of since season one. He's like, is there any movie magic we can do here? What he means by that is like, you know, what can we do in editing to make the shot better? We do a lot of, um, well, like editing is invisible. So we do a lot of things with, you know, we have a great VFX editor who helps us out. We're doing, you know, composite splits to take a certain piece of one performance and another piece and create a new shot just to get the pacing right and the flow right. Now, obviously, this podcast is a remote interview, which can be frustrating to do, especially when we recorded in Los Angeles and AJ and Melissa were in London. But it was incredibly easy because of Riverside. Honestly, if you're not using Riverside for all of your virtual meetings, you're making a big mistake. I've even been using it for consultations. As soon as we're done, I get to send them the entire recording. And not to mention the recording quality is freaking it's good. Whereas other virtual meeting services can only do up to 720, Riverside can do 4K. Which is why we like to use it for podcasting. And we love it because it records each audio and video track separately so that editing is such a breeze when we get into post. Which means our editor can get started on cutting it Almost immediately. And even if you or your guest has absolute garbage internet, it doesn't matter. Because remember that one time when we were in the hotel room? I mean, the call kept on jostling. I thought we lost it, but because Riverside records locally and then uploads, the call was perfect. And it's easy for the guests. I don't need to install anything. You just send them the link and you can start recording. It even says like, roll out the red carpet. It's kind of, it's kind of cool. Yeah, it makes it, me feel special. It makes me feel so special. If you're podcasting, creating video content or recording online calls, then sign up to riverside.fm for free and use code editing podcast for 20% off. And you can find that link in the description and we'll see you back in the interview. And there's so much power in silence like that is it speaks so loudly especially in a comedy drama like it's usually just filled with lines and filled with stuff happening the thing that we keep coming back to is just the looks that the the performances that the actors gave and the, your ability to capture that and then make it even better was absolutely incredible that's what i learned on this show the the comedy doesn't have to play fast right as you mentioned that's that's how you, you're used to seeing it. The comedy is joke, joke, joke. What is this glutinous monstrosity before me? The sugar in this is quite sweet. Ooh! <laughs> On this show, and this this is something that happened back in season one. Jason and and Bill really wanted to let things breathe and have the audience have a chance to you know live in those moments and feel. As long as they let Carlton do his thing, I was always going to take him in and just sit right there. Yeah, sidebar: Alfonso Ribeiro, the greatest physical comedian of the nineteenth, twentieth, and twenty first century. Case in point, right here. Hey. Iconic. Yeah. I never know how to react when a grown man does the cartoon in front of me. And so we, we cut the show a lot slower than a, a traditional comedy and uh, it worked. What was a scene that could have been or probably easily could have been like a faster scene, but then you knew to try to make it pace it slower, to tell the jokes better? What scene worked best because you had to massage the pacing in that sense? Well, I guess I, I, what comes to me first is 303's uh, his entrance to the team. And he's just looking around to everything, everyone. And there's just reactions going back and forth. And then we play this great blocking game where Ted, Azaba steps in front of Ted. Now, I was just rolling, laughing, cutting this because it was all just those pauses and beats that is non-dialogue. And then on top of all that, we indulge ourselves with this breathing scene. Right now, okay, here we go.
I really want to take my time with that, just letting Zava be, because he doesn't say much. He's a, he's a character of few words. I was always thinking that it was just really a fun scene that was just non-verbal, and it was just all in the pauses and the looks and the reactions. We are now one. <laughs> it's really making me think a lot more about it is how much more can be said with silences, how much more can be said with non-verbal communication, and that being you guys' priority. Because there's been so many great performances, could we like cut the whole show down to just just reactions and the, to the story could still be told. Yeah, it's, it's on people's faces, definitely. Um, especially with our cast. Hannah, Hannah's is wonderful with, you just see the, the pain that she's still feeling and trying to deal with a lot of her, her own insecurities. And, and also you love it when she has those victory moments, like, you know, after she kind of tells Roy Kent off. What do you want, Roy? Hmm? What do you really want? I just want to be left alone. Troy, you want way more than that. You're just so convinced that you don't deserve anything good in your life that you'd rather eat a bowl of soup and then complain about the portion. And he walks out of the room and you just see her kind of, this slow smile creeps across her face and she grabs a biscuit. And so much reads on our great cast faces. They were so very good. Yeah, and a lot of what they're going through is so internal. It's so, you know, these are such humanistic stories I feel like we're telling. And yeah, the one I was thinking about was after in 302 and Rupert, surprises Hannah in the hallway. What a lovely surprise. Then they have their conversation where they're trying to, it's a little bit of cat and mouse. They're trying to one-up each other. Oh, congratulations, by the way, on the win against Leicester yesterday. Thank you. We are so lucky to have a manager like Nathan. It's a gaffer who really understands the game. And then he lands the final blow. You know, Rupert, I was a little bit surprised when you bought West Ham. I always thought that Richmond was your one true love. Oh, I guess I'm just like any man, just get bored with the same old, same old. You just hold on Hannah for like the longest time in her close up and she's taking it in and you can just see the hurt and the pain and the anger. We had the luxury this year of doing a um, premiere screening and we had it at a big theater, at a movie theater in Westwood and in LA and we were in with an audience and that's not usually typical for, for TV editors. But yeah, after he said that line and delivered it and you see her face, so I heard somebody behind me just go, what a dick you know and they all, everybody just could like revel in that anger and it's like you don't really get that when you're just in television a lot of times because it's just you know you just don't get that big audience reaction and then when she slammed through the door you are such a king chicken shit. people applauded the feeling of that of like riding that with an audience was so amazing because you know i think a lot of times in tv and uh, when you're on a network show you have to be to the frame so you don't have the luxury of what we had for these three seasons where it's like well we can make it what we want to make it you know and so often we get into this like faster fast it should be faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and like that was a lesson in like oh we let that audience sit in that anger so then when she busted through that door you are such a king chicken sh everybody applauded you don't want to overstay your welcome but also when you have people buy that you know where they they're like yes get it you know and they get to go on that ride and cheer for your characters wow what a feeling there's a difference between telling us how to feel and then allowing us to feel you gave us that time to manifest into it I mean, yeah, it's one of the benefits of this being on a stream streaming platform. It's like you're not tied down to those time constraints. You can make this whatever length feels what's best for it. Hi. Smooth transition. <laughs> we just wanted to take a moment to let you know about some of our favorite products. Did you know that running a YouTube channel is really hard? We didn't. We've been podcasting for almost a year now, and it's like a startup life. And Creative Juice understands that making a creative business is messy and confusing. And they found ways to make it as easy as possible with Juice Club. It's the ultimate members only community for creators like you and Hayden and I. Hello. Looking to level up their business. And here's all the perks that they will give you. Create a community, monthly ad sets advances, unlimited bookkeeping growth tools, and beta brand boosts too. As the creator economy continues to boom, most creators end up feeling isolated. I mean, literally me and Jordan are in two completely different buildings and we're working together. Like I haven't seen them in weeks. I miss you, bro. I miss you too, man. We didn't hang out more. We do like a podcast. Hayden, I miss you so much. Community and resources can be the difference between a creator burnout or growth. You deserve financial tools and resources catered to your needs. So if you want to join the Juice Club, hit the link in the description and we'll see you in there.
Do you like this music? It makes footage like this feel gorgeous to watch and feel. And it's easy to put in your videos with Track Club. It's a sound library that's disciplined in not bloating itself with hundreds of thousands of tracks, but it only keeps the great ones that can complement your footage to feel like this. We even use Track Club with our Pixar intro. The music's so good, it works with Pixar. I can even download the stems, throw them in a multicam, and just start with the pianos, and then slowly bring in each instrument myself. I have total control of how I want the music to play in my content. And if you want to keep it simple, you can even do it with Mixlab. If you want your content to feel as good as this, go ahead and hit the link in the description to get your free month of Track Club now. I'm really curious, actually, about the FU conversation with mom. I think that was like a dagger in the heart. Well, thank you. Cooking dinner, both of them. No, oh, you're welcome. And thank you for not wanting to talk. Excuse me? Well, you know, that was uh, a challenge, that scene, because we haven't seen the mom since, like, technically the first act of the episode, if you will. So by the time we come back to mom, a good maybe 40 minutes of episode has passed. He enters in um, on that wide, wide shot, and, and, you know, she has such a distinct voice that you recognize. Hello? Ooh, welcome home. So we're back in Ted's head with her a little bit. I cut that scene two ways. We had two passes, as you usually do. You have the, the wide pass, which is on first, and then you have the, the close pass. And Jason likes to be shot last, usually. So sometimes things happen on the close pass that you, you don't have in the wide, and that's always a, a challenge. And fuck you. For not working on yourself. We're seeking help after we lost dad. I remember cutting the scene all from the wide coverage and all from the close coverage, so I had it both. And in the long run, I think we decided to let mom, when she when she steps in, when Ted starts crying and she steps in and embraces him, that was our motivation to then go get close and use the close coverage. So that's something that Jason is a big fan of, and I think every editor should try that, is, you know, make every cut motivate and kind of figure out, you know, why you're cutting to uh, another shot or, or or closer coverage or wider coverage. The close up is where we probably can see a lot more of those micro movements and we probably get excited to probably want to showcase that. You seem to be aware of like when you do cut to that close up has to be a really, really good reason. Once they kind of had got through like uh, the, the thick of it and that argument then brought them closer together. For me, it felt like that's when you cut to that close up because they are now closer, so therefore we can cut to them closer now as well. That's, that's exactly what Jason said too, yeah. I think a lot of the times this year he wanted to play things wider. He, he was, you know, concerned, I think, season three having such high expectations and, and you know such a huge act to follow after season two and season one that he wanted to make sure we weren't like telegraphing too much but then just have motivations he's always asking that in the cutting room i, I think he does this with mel too like you know why did you do this what's the reason he loves it when you give an answer that just he's like yeah yeah i said you're right you're right you're right just moving on and he he kind of goes on with with the, the cut and not worries about it but he, he likes for you to ha have some sort of reasoning yeah, because he loves editing and he loves the discussion. What are like common motivations you give when you're asked that question? Like, what do you, what it's, what's something that you say like, oh, I cut to this because blank. It's always character based for me. It was like, oh, I, you know, wanted to get to this moment because this is, this is, says this, you know, like X, Y, or Z. And so, yeah, the Colin Trent conversation on the stairs. And that was the second time I came out to that. This time, however, she believed me. And so I had a two shot, no AB coverage. So it was like a two shot and then two close ups. And it was like, basically you're going wide to tight. So I knew when I wanted to go in, it was when he started, kind of started his speech. My whole life is two lives, really. I've got my work life. No one at the club knows. But then at one point he says, I have an ache in my heart. And she helped me realize that I have an ache. So I knew I had to get back out for that. So then it was like finding a moment where it would be the least noticeable. You know, that was the that was the thing for me. It was like, I just didn't want anything to bump in this whole speech. But after he says that line, James Lance, who's an amazing actor, both in his in the wide and in the tight, gave like kind of like an inhale. Like he knew that ache himself. And so then it was like a beautiful like match cut to get back in. It was a silent reaction to that where he was like, I've felt that ache. And I, maybe Jason even asked me and I was like, that was that was my cut point to get back in. Jason and I called it like twiddling of the dials. Stay one more line on Billy and save those Trent reactions for when they really mean something. The physicality of wanting to see him 
hold his heart and like feel that. So you had to get to that wide. AJ, you said multiple times that Jason says that the final rewrite is in the edit. Is there other instances where from it's from scripting, from it being shooted, and then in the editing that essentially you've had to do like a pretty either like a major rewrite or a small or even just a small change in that detail. Jason, uh, in in to go back to three hundred five, that that locker room speech. All we need to win are the fellows in this room right now. And all you fellas need to do is believe it. He rewrote a lot of the lines that Ted sang to the team and performed many of them in ADR because we were, you know, so much of it was covered. You know what I want to mess around with? The belief that I matter, you know? Regardless of what I do or don't achieve. He appreciates that he has an opportunity to try things with, with ADR. And sometimes he's moving things around. We moved around, uh, and again, 305 comes to mind, but we moved around where Ted's having the, the FaceTime conversation with Henry. Look, I've been really wanting to talk to you about what happened in school the other day, you know? Dad, I messed up. We moved some scenes so that we could have the, the whole team conversation going on, learning that Zava's has left the team. I have to tell you, Zava has played his last match. So that as soon as then we came back to Ted having the conversation, he hears the team. Uh, we added a sound effect of the team grumbling uh, outside. So he hears that and that's his motivation to get off the, the FaceTime call with Henry. You're welcome. <laughs> um, hey, buddy, I got to go talk to the team here real quick. So there are instances where we're doing, the, it feels like we're rewriting and moving things around if it serves the, the cut better. And it, it's great that Jason is, is very uh, open to trying those things if, if it helps the story flow better. The structure of the script feels completely different as soon as you put it all in the timeline. And then sometimes you have to be like readjusting or, and moving some things around to try to maintain that the structure and the story is really clear. You move this forward and it creates a, like a beautiful butterfly effect across the whole episode. Like, oh. That, like that tone and that feeling is now to change because you just put that there. But that butterfly effect, I think, is something I can imagine being really, really challenging with this being a comedy drama. So where it's like there are scenes that are really, really funny and then sometimes the next scene is dramatic. Oh my oh. God. I'm sorry about that. I, I was trying to come in soft like a human cotton ball. No, God, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm here late. It's all right. And I've always been really impressed in how you managed to make those transitions work. So what was the balance like to make comedy and drama work and unite perfectly? Listen, Ted. I know. It's okay. They're so creative in making their joke and the making the jokes like something surprising in 308 when Keely's talking to Rebecca and she's had pictures of herself on the internet before, but having something stolen and putting on the something personal that she didn't agree to was different. I know there are tons of topless photos of me online. Those were my choice. Absolutely. It makes a huge difference. <laughs> Should I be ashamed or embarrassed? What? I don't know. Oh. It's kind of like a moment where, you know, she's like worried about it and they hug. And then we cut to our French player still deleting photos. It's also French sisters. <laughs> Spain twins. From like the scene before. Deleting photos makes no sense. What, do we delete our memories too? No, because no one can steal your memories. What if I took the photo? You should delete it. What if it was a Christmas card? Delete it, bro. What if it's artsy? What the f*** does that mean? It's in black and white and you can't see her head. Delete it, mate. What if I'm French? Delete it. I just always remember being like, we set that up earlier and we paid it off there to kind of like undercut the more emotional moment. And I feel like that's a brilliant aspect of, of Jason and their mind of just of like hitting you with something unexpected to kind of like pull you out of being a little bit sad. I think we're always thinking character. We're always thinking story. We're always thinking, you know, those things. And then we just have a really talented cast that can pull it off. Like they really pull off those jokes. This show is all about toxic masculinity. We have a lot of men trying to be boys and we have a lot of issues with dads and with fatherhood. And I think it's such an important topic to talk about and to explain. And so what does that mean to you? And how did you make that work as an editor from an editing perspective? Ted Lasso is a show about vulnerability and, um, realizing that vulnerability is essential. I think it's wonderful that our teammates could be honest with each other and share their feelings. And then you kind of see Nate does the reverse of this in, in season two. Everybody loves you. 
the great Ted Lasso. Well, I, I think you're a f***ing joke. And he starts to make a lot of assumptions. And um, so I think that's the message of the show is, and Jason said this when we went to the, the White House, for goodness sakes. I mean, our show's gone all the way to the to the White House to the point where it's a, making a political statement. And he says, But I truly believe that it, we should all do our best to help take care of each other. That's, that's my own personal belief. I think that's something that everybody up here on stage believes in. That's, that's things we talk about in the writer's room, we talk about in the editing room, and everything in between. Definitely, we, we've seen our, our characters grow. Jamie Tart grew from the, you know, the prince prick of all pricks. Yummy for you. Mmm. Spearmint. Make the money smell nice. To being a really caring, beautiful soul at the end, who becomes the leader, you know, uh, of the team. Yeah, but it's hard. You know, we have moments where our characters fail that. I think, you know, I think we see that a bit in 312 and Roy and Jamie are fighting over Keeley. They kind of regress a little bit, but that's intentional. I think we're showing that, you know, that this constant work to do this. And and that said, I'm uh, talking about the, the absolute feminine power energy in this show. Uh, Rebecca and Keeley are two of the most beautiful, you know, women characters. You know, she is a boss ass bitch and I just love when they come together. You helped this panda become a lion. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. <laughs> the beauty of this show is that it subverts, I think, the expectations or what has been shown in television and movies before. Like, you know, that was a beautiful discovery for me in season one with the, key, speaking of the feminine energy, is like the Keeley-Rebecca friendship, right? Like usually women are more pitted against each other or they're in competition. And I remember being so delighted in episode three, Keeley comes in and is like, I'm not afraid of you anymore. You know, I've decided to not be scared of you anymore. I didn't know you were. Oh yeah, I was up. I'm terrified of you. I remember watching Hannah's performance and being like, oh, she's finding a little bit of, like, she's such a hard exterior. We hadn't seen her really soften that much. Maybe here and there, you know, as Ted would, she's trying to figure out Ted's motivation. But when she sees Keely, and this is before I even knew Sassy was a character. Like, we kind of didn't know what was coming. But I remember Hannah's performance of, of taking a little delight in Keely. And, and playing some of those where you're like, oh, are they going to become friends? And then by seven, they do. And you meet Sassy and you're like, oh, this all makes sense. And then I think for the toxic masculinity, I think it's so fun to explore that in the world of sports because I think sports allows you to become vulnerable because it's such an like emotional thing. You know, you train very hard and you want to be the best and you compete. And then if you fail and then those quiet moments in the locker room, it's like you let your guard down. And, I'm, and it just would be, I mean, it's not something I think that comes along often when you can show that those moments. You're at your lowest and you're most, most vulnerable. And I think that's something beautiful that Ted Lasso was able to do was like show those moments. I think being called to become a better person, like when Beard's watching Henry experiencing what Ted's going through, you know, Ted's not checked in and Beard steps in to do that. It's like Beard is compelled to do something, is to compelled to, to help. Now, Drew's dad had a best friend. And that best friend was real worried about Jude and all his sad feelings. I don't know. I think that's such an important thing the show did was to show that men can do that. And that's something Jason said to me at one point, like, yeah, feel your power. And it's like, you know, to say that to a woman in Hollywood, it's like, wow, thank you, you know, because you don't get that. You don't get that a lot. It's one of my favorite things. and One of the best experiences I've had when watching the show. Like, it's very, very hard for men to talk about their feelings. And, and I think because it's like we're often educated that we're not allowed to. And so this whole show was for me showcasing the positive that can happen when men simply talk to each other, check in on each other. How are you feeling? What's going on? And sharing each other's perspectives. And I think it's like, that's why I, I, I like to uh, visualize this show as a really perfect example of positive masculinity. And I like how inspiring that is. And it inspires me to reach out to friends, you know, in, in the same sense, I see you one small uh, dark moment from them and that makes me go I think they need someone to talk to and like it's encouraged me to do that now ah that's beautiful see that's why we work on the show for comments like that see how it touches people it's taught me so much about selflessness and grace and forgiveness and giving people second chances and seeing the good in people it's amazing that we get to see it from a man's perspective which normally isn't stereotypical so it's nice to subvert that but it's just 
helpful for humanity in general. The football was like the C plot or the D plot, but like the A and B plot was like the characters and the people and the setups and the payoffs and the comedy. Whereas like essentially, yeah, the, the, the football was the backdrop of just all of it. And I that's one of the things I do love so much about this show. Where it's like it's marketed about a game about football, but it's actually it's a show about, as we said, like male positivity and relationships and characters and people. Thank you.